And as I was saying, this is our second week in this sermon series. And this sermon series is called Dangerous Prayers. And um, would invite you and challenge you to be part of that. And before we get going too far, we're going to have our young kids. Uh, we have an age-appropriate lesson for them each week. Uh, children's church in our lower level. So if you are preschool on through fourth grade, to head out with the Swanson team there. And you can see they're excited to go. They do like to pray, don't get me wrong. But... Uh, they're going to be downstairs with an age-appropriate lesson. And as I was saying, um, we've been working through this for two weeks. This is our second week of it. If you didn't pick up a guide last week, that's okay. Pick it up this week and kick it off. You don't have to be in the exact same spot or place as the rest of us. Um, this is a blessing. to If you want to do it in June, do it in June. The 21 Days of Prayer is, is a fabulous, fabulous tool. And so uh, we're going to be looking at two passages of Scripture primarily today. We're going to look at Jeremiah 17, 9 through 10, and then Psalm 139, 23, and 24. And so we're going to start off and kick things off in the book of Jeremiah. So if you'd like a Bible, there's some in the pews. There's some on the Welcome Center. You're welcome to use an electronic Bible if you've got one of those as well. Uh, Jeremiah 17, 9 through 10. Eventually we'll throw that up on the screen. But before we do that, I'm going to give you a little bit of background and context for this passage so you understand what's going on here. And this passage of Jeremiah, and this segment of Jeremiah, in fact, is, is talking about our brokenness, that, that we are all broken, that we're, we're all messed up. You, me, all of us are messed up. We're all broken. And in our brokenness, as, as part of our human condition, it makes it very difficult to own and embrace the responsibility we have for that brokenness. We, we oftentimes don't accept responsibility for the decisions that we have made that have led to the places where we've landed. And, and then not only that, not only do we not take personal responsibility, but then oftentimes what happens is somebody comes along and kind of gives us an excuse for why it is the way that we are behaving. And so we have this new excuse that we can replay, that when somebody says, well, why do you act that way? Oh, here's my excuse, right? And we replay those things for the rest of our lives if we don't have something that interrupts it. Now this passage, this verse, or set of verses, I do believe, though, is, is perhaps the best set of verses in all of the Bible that illustrates this very kind of thing. Now back to the background part of this. Back about 600 B.C., there was a prophet by the name of Jeremiah. You've maybe heard of Jeremiah before. That's, of course, who this book is named for. And, and, and this book of Jeremiah is about his prophecies. And if you just sit down and you go and read the book of Jeremiah, you'll find it's kind of confusing and mostly depressing. It is. I'll tell you the truth. And the reason for that is that, that, that Jeremiah was prophesying towards a, a very specific set of events. But those events that he's talking about and against don't actually get chronicled in this book. So all you get, they call Jeremiah the crying prophet. All you get basically is his crying, his whining, his wailing, his lamenting. And not a lot of context to understand why it is. And so to understand what's happening with Jeremiah, you've got to go ahead and then read some of the other books of the Old Testament so that you don't just see him as some ranting, raving lunatic, but instead as a, a prophet of God. And, and it'll help you understand it. But you do have to do the homework of connecting A to B. You can't just read Jeremiah all by itself and really understand the full story. Now, during the time of Jeremiah, the nation of Israel was under God's judgment. And if you've read the Old Testament at all, you kind of have a feel for this, right? That, that, that spiritual roller coaster of Israel. That, that the nation of Israel would disobey God. It would begin to worship other gods. It would fall into idolatry. And God would then take the surrounding nations and use them to judge the people of God. They would invade. They would conquer Israel. And it was at that point that Israel would look around and go, Oh yeah, this is not fun. Uh, maybe we should change something, right? Oh yeah, we should pray to God. He, he covenanted with us. So, if you know your Old Testament, this happens time and time again. They act like fools, they have idolatry, they get taken captive, they get conquered, and then after however long of a period, they realize, this is miserable. Why are we doing this? Oh yeah, God can save us. 
And so they would pray to God, and then God would gear up, and God would show up, and uh, He would restore them and demonstrate His power and protect His people. And, and, and time and time and time again, this pattern happens throughout the Old Testament. Well, during this period of time of Jeremiah, uh, when Jeremiah was a prophet, um, the nation, as I said, was under God's judgment by a man by the name of Nebuchadnezzar. You may have heard of him before. I've often recommended if you're picking names for your kids, this is not one to pick. Nebuchadnezzar was not a good guy. But he was the king of Babylon. In fact, the emperor, so to speak, of Babylon. Babylon was the superpower of the world at this time. And Nebuchadnezzar had put in charge Jehoiakim as king of Israel. And so he said, Jehoiakim, you can be, you can be the king of Israel, but you've got to pay me taxes. And you've got to do everything that I say. And you're not allowed to have a standing army. Well, Jehoiakim decided, well, I don't know if I like this. Enough of this. And he had read the Old Testament on his own, or he'd read the scrolls and the scriptures of his time. And basically, despite being appointed by Nebuchadnezzar, he basically said, we're not going to take it, right? Any 80s rockers out there? Just me? Okay, never mind. But he said, we're not going to put up with this. We're not going to put up with you being over us anymore, Nebuchadnezzar. So he starts to raise an army, one of the things he was forbidden from doing. And they're about to declare war on Nebuchadnezzar. Now, if you don't understand this, this would be like Minnesota saying, we're going to go to war against the rest of the United States. Not going to go well if we do, right? So Jeremiah sees this going on. He goes into Jehoiakim and he says, Jehoiakim, are you crazy? Have you lost your mind? We are under God's judgment. That's what's got us into this position. You cannot win this war. You're going against God. Not to mention common sense, buddy. Jehoiakim says, well, get out of here, Jeremiah. I don't want to listen to that. I'm doing what I want anyhow. I'm the king of Israel, not you. Jehoiakim barely gets the war started. I mean, we're talking like for a minute. Nebuchadnezzar marches right in Jerusalem, lays the smack down, puts Jehoiakim in chains, and puts this other guy named Zedekiah on the throne. And I'm serious, this took like a minute. They were barely getting the battle started, and it was over. That's the disparity between the powers in this fight. So now Zedekiah is king. Jeremiah goes into Zedekiah, and he says, Zedekiah, cool your heels. Chill out, relax. We're under God's judgment here. Relax. Eventually God will rescue us, but... Give it some time, right? Your responsibility as king is not to go to war. Your responsibility as king, Jeremiah says, your responsibility is to bring the nation back to repentance to God. And if you will do that, then God will honor his covenant. Well, Zedekiah, time goes by. He begins to think, you know what? I can take this dude out. Nebuchadnezzar's not that bad, right? So he starts raising up an army. He's going to declare war on the superpower once again, right? And Jeremiah's like, buddy, I mean, I know you haven't read a lot of our history books, but like a week ago, they handed us our rear. Pay attention to history or you're doomed to repeat it, right? Don't you remember this thing that we just went through? They creamed us. And he says, well, you know what? going to be different this time because I'm leading. We're going to overthrow Nebuchadnezzar. We're going to do our own thing. We're an independent nation. We're not a superpower, but we're going to be one. And Jeremiah's going, no, 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 not this, not again. You're not listening to me. We are under God's judgment. The people haven't repented. You haven't led us well. It is not the time to raise up an army. It's the time for repentance. And he wails and he laments and he cries. Zedekiah won't listen. He does not listen to Jeremiah. He does not understand the history. And history repeats itself. And so Jeremiah, as we read the book of Jeremiah, is so frustrated, right? He's like, what is up with these people? You guys are crazy. I mean, he's thinking this is absolutely unbelievable. And so part of this book of Jeremiah is just Jeremiah going, God, what is up with these people 
why me? Why did you choose me to have to talk to them? They're fools. And in Jeremiah chapter 17, he makes a statement that I I think helps us understand uh, the dynamic of our own hearts as well. And it certainly helps explain some of what we experience around us each and every day. And, and, And it's not good news. Jeremiah does not bring much good news at all. But it's true news. And it is news if you internalize it and you understand it and you use it as a filter for the rest of your life. It will help you understand who you are better. And it's news that if we embrace it, both corporately and personally, and certainly as a nation as well, if we were to embrace this, we could make incredible progress. So here's what Jeremiah said in the midst of all of this chaos he was in. He said this, and maybe you've heard this before, you've read this before, but starting in Jeremiah 17, 9, he says, the heart, as in your heart, my heart, all hearts, the heart is deceitful above all things, and it's beyond cure. Who can understand it? Notice that he uses the word deceitful, right? Not dishonest, but deceitful. You know, there's a difference, right, between deceitfulness and dishonesty. I mean, you've had people just lie outright to you, and you figured they were lying, and you can pretty much tell a lie when you see a lie a lot of times, right? But deceit is subtle, and it's different. Because deceit is generally a little bit of truth and a little bit of lie, blended together, right? And because of that, it can be difficult to see. It can be difficult to discern when deceit is happening. It can be hard to tell if somebody is using deceit. And so Jeremiah uses this word. He says, your heart, my heart, is by nature, by nature of the fact that we live in a fallen, sin-filled world, that when sin came into the world, it broke our hearts. He's saying, our hearts, the heart of man is deceitful, above all things. So in other words, Jeremiah speaking on behalf of God says, your heart and my heart is the most deceitful thing on the planet. Welcome to Glory Baptist Church. Good morning. But Jeremiah says our hearts, our hearts are the very most deceitful thing on the planet, right? And not only do our hearts deceive other people, but it's worse than that. And here's why it's such a big deal for us. Your heart and my heart have the potential, the ability to deceive ourselves. We deceive ourselves. We lie. And, 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 and this, I mean, if you hear this and you see this, you, you should go, yeah, this is crazy. But we lie to ourselves and then we believe it. Right? That sounds crazy crazy to me when I say it out loud anyhow. And that's why you start telling a story to excuse your behavior, that a story you learned and a story that maybe somebody told you or that you've come up with, that you've manufactured, that 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 you tell to explain things away, that this feels like reality to me. And let me explain to you why it is that I act this way. Let me give you my excuse for why I have this sin in my life. Why I'm holding on to it, why I won't give it up, why I do what it is that I do. And as we, as we create and share and give those excuses out, it keeps us from making progress. And we'll never be able to progress until we come to terms with the fact that we are lying to ourselves. So Jeremiah, Jeremiah throws up his hands and he asks the question, Who can understand this, right? Who can understand it? I think we've all experienced it. You ever look back on your life, look back on some of the decisions that you've made in your past and said, what was I thinking? Right? I have. That's a long list. What was I thinking? 
Why did I do that? Why did we purchase that? What were we thinking? Why did I move in there? Why did I ever trust him? Why, why, did, I, why did I ever call her? And then why did I ever call her a second? And then why, why didn't I listen to my mama? She said she was bad news, but I went back again. What was I thinking? Right? Jeremiah says, don't be surprised. This is a permanent condition. You will, if you're not careful for the rest of your life, look back on decisions you've made and think, what was I doing? And he said the reason for this is because our hearts are deceitful. And that's not a criticism. It's an observation. Which means all along the way for the rest of your life, for the rest of my life, there are times where where it's going to be necessary for us to sit down and to kind of do a, a fearless personal moral inventory. Because at the end of the day, we can't begin to deal with the problem and find healing until we identify and admit there is a problem. But here's the problem with that. We're the problem, right? We're the problem. We keep being the problem. And that means, on our own, we're not likely to find the solution. And we're even more unlikely to be the solution. Because we're the problem. So that brings us to our second set of verses today. Psalm 139, 23 and 24. If you don't know where Psalms is, right in the middle of your Bible. And in Psalm 139, it's King David talking. And King David says these words. He says, search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. And see if there be any grievous way in me. And lead me in the way everlasting. Notice in this that it's God who searches our heart, right? Why? Because we don't know the depths of our own sin. Remember, our hearts are deceitful. And we need outside intervention. We, each and every one of us, have blind spots in our lives. Areas we cannot fully discern by ourselves. And we need God to examine us, to show us where those places lie. And David, of course, the king of ancient Israel, he found himself in the midst of a, 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 of a confused national situation. His kingdom was torn by internal strife at this time. Slave hated master. Master hated slave. People blamed the government. Government was blaming the people. David's nation stood on the brink, very brink of a perilous civil war. And David knew that if this, this tide of sin continued to rise, his nation would collapse spiritually. And he knew the economic depression and moral disintegration and military defeat would inevitably come if his nation was allowed to continue on the spiritual decline. So David did what intelligent people should do when they reached the very end of their rope. He turned to God. And the Spirit of God revealed to him That the spiritual tide of his nation could rise no higher than the spiritual level of his own heart. So in that moment, King David fell upon his knees in utter humility and he prayed, Search me, O God. Know my heart. Try me. And know my anxieties. And see if there's any wickedness within me and lead me in the way everlasting. If only we could realize that as a nation we can rise no higher, that we can be no stronger, no better than the individuals that compose that nation, right? The world is bad, and it is the people who are bad. If the world is confused, then it's the people who are confused. If the world seems godless, then it's the people who are godless. And David realized this truth. And in his wisdom, he concluded that he should start making things right himself. Here was a a wise confession on the part of a great leader. A humble admission that a nation's sickness could be attributed to his own spiritual ills. And so David turned his face 
to the altar of God. He, he prayed earnestly for God to begin revival of the nation by kindling a fire of revival in his own heart. See, here's the thing. Revival always has to start in our own heart. And not only did David pray that he might know God, but that God would know him. Search me, O God, he says, right? His heart yearns, as our hearts should yearn today, for personal, vital intimacy with our Creator God. And in short, David was was praying for a definite and real and tangible experience with God. Now, most of us know about God, right? But it's quite a different thing than really knowing God. It is one thing to be introduced to a person, but quite another thing to know him personally. And then David prays in verse 24. He says, God, see if there's any grievous way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. David's prayer contains the right sequence of things. First, he prays that God would know him. Then he prays that God would cleanse him. And then he prayed that God would direct him. David's transformation as a result of this prayer was full and complete. It was through this that Israel was brought back into harmony with God. And David's son Solomon then went on to lead Israel into the greatest time of prosperity the nation had ever known. But you see, it took David's dangerous prayer to get to a place where this could happen. Dangerous prayer because it meant change. Dangerous prayer because it meant exposing his sin. Dangerous prayer because it was incredibly uncomfortable for him to admit that at the tip of the spear, he was the first problem. And a change had to start with him. And so I dare you. I dare you to pray this prayer with David. I say this Because if you understand prayer, you'll see it takes courage to pray it. It takes courage because you are inviting God to show you your sins, your weaknesses, and your defects. And that's not always an easy thing to see. You see, usually we want to hide that stuff, right? We call them skeletons in a closet sometimes. We don't want people to see that. We don't want people to know that. Ah, We don't talk about that. Usually we want to hide that stuff. We don't like having to see all of our sins, all of our weaknesses, and then think about them and dwell on them, do we? And we certainly don't want God to see them. Although He does anyhow. We certainly don't want others to see them. We hide our sin. Often, we respond by living in denial to keep us from having to look at these things. Then, if if God or somebody brings them up, we get defensive, right? You know how it works. Well, I'm still better than this guy. Or it's not that bad. Or here's my reason why I behave this way. Here's why I haven't quit doing this. Here's why I do this. And we roll out that story, that excuse. It takes courage to pray this prayer because you are inviting God to correct your issues. You're not praying this prayer for somebody else. You're praying that God would come in and and take care of your issues so that you can walk in His paths. And this can be hard to do. And I'm sharing this with you because as hard as it might be, this is the way to grow in Christian life. It is only when we open ourselves up fully to God that He can show us our problems, the things that we are blind to. And it is only when we become aware of these things that we can begin to receive His help to overcome them. And remember, try as you might to hide it, God already knows. 
God knows all of your grievous ways. And probably some other people in your life know about them too, even if you've been trying to hide it. So instead of living in denial and being defensive, ask God for help. Don't run away from God with your struggles. Run to Him. We are the problem and we can't fix it. Only God can. So as we are studying and working our way through dangerous prayers, I would encourage you to pray this and to continue to pray this and to listen to what God has to say and to have the faith to allow God to lead you in the way everlasting. Now let's take a little moment, even right now, to do just that. That is, if you are willing, maybe join me in praying this prayer. I believe God will speak to you even now. Let's pray.